yeah, so then we decided to to go check out the local ski club because there there were water ski club uh, like in the area. So uh, we brought our boat and went up there because they didn't have a good boat at the time, and we actually got to borrow their course uh, just to try it out. Um, and we skied a couple of sets, and that was just such an eye opener, you know, skiing for at least the better part of 20 years and then have something to chase, you know, the buoys, that was just, that was amazing, like pouring gasoline on the fire. Welcome back or welcome to the Water Ski Podcast. This is Matteo Luzzeri, your host, and the goal of this podcast is to promote water skiing. Water skiers, people that water ski, people that are curious about water skiing. It's a podcast about water skiing. Welcome to episode 63, which is my interview with Eric Bergiller. Eric is the founder and innovator behind Rodex Innovation company that is creating the off course a product that i must say when i stumbled upon uh news about it early on it must have been a couple of years ago i was shocked about the potential that this product has but i won't spoil too much details now i'll let you listen to this interview with uh, eric whom i connected via bolo spray actually and just because I'm super curious and excited about what he's working on. And it doesn't fail. Uh, every time I, I ask someone to tell me their story into water skiing, it's a super fascinating one. And Eric is, is definitely no exception. Um, it was cool to hear how you know he approached skiing as a fun hobby and then found out with his brother through Marcus's videos about another side of water skiing he wasn't aware of, how a trip to Extreme Gene basically hooked him into the slalom course, and how his problem-solving um, attitude brought about, after a lot of effort, the, the creation of the off course. Before we get into today's episode, I want you to know that the Water Ski Podcast has a new advertiser and it's Real Frequency College Consulting. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, if you're a parent or a collegiate bound water skier, this is an exciting and stressful time. It's common to become overwhelmed with the admission process, college research, deadlines, essays, and picking the perfect college ski club culture. Let's face it, they're all pretty awesome. Um, are you and your student making the best decisions to increase success and mitigate risk? Real Frequency College Consulting is with you every step of the way. With weekly contact and face-to-face -face consultation, Real Frequency ensures your student is held accountable so that you don't have to. Real Frequency offers comprehensive college reports on over 6,400 institutions and extensive info for NCWSA affiliated schools. Real Frequency is there for career path guidance, the connector of internships and career research. As a result, your student graduates on time with a career so they can afford to pull you skiing in their boat sooner. Real Frequency also offers financial planning from a college economic specialist and access to your very own admission essay specialist. There is so much more. This process can feel like running your hardest pass. And I must say, as a, as a foreign student trying to get into a, a US college, that was, that was challenging. Um, let Real Frequency take on the stress of emissions so you can enjoy the course. You can go on realfrequency.com, that's R-E-A-L frequency.com, or you can call 509-992-2888 and schedule your free consultation. Real Frequency, the stress isn't worth it, but a college consultant is. You can mention TWSP, or apparently you can also say Matteo is the man, and you can receive six off, six, obviously the count of the buoys, uh, you can receive 6% off for six to 12 months benefit. So again, realfrequency.com, you can mention TWSP or Matteo is the man. 
Now, let's jump into this interview. Again, very happy that I got the story from Eric, and I think you guys are going to not only appreciate the man, uh, but the story as well. And uh, most likely, you're going to be excited about what he's creating uh, nearly as much as I am. So sit back and enjoy the interview. Eric, my friend, welcome to the Water Ski Podcast. Uh, I'm super happy to have you here. I know it's the first time we sort of, you know, uh, have a chance to, to meet up, but uh, I've been following your project for a while, um, since basically two or three years, I think, has been in the making, but w we'll get there. Um, the first thing I want to say is thank you for being here. Uh, stoked to have you. Thank you, Matteo. Stoked to be here. Uh, listen to basically all your previous episodes and really enjoy the podcast and looking forward to talking to you. Thank you. Well, um, since you have been listening to the podcast, you sort of know how this goes. So you're already prepared for the first question. And I'm super curious to hear how, how did you get into water skiing? Uh, you know, I grew up uh, in a rural area with a lot of lakes um, and my family did a lot of outdoor activities like alpine skiing in the winter and skating uh, and water skiing was a uh, part of the summer activity so we always like had a boat at the local lake um, and there was this one particular beach where like all my relatives went as well and everyone had a boat and there was just a lot of water skiing and tubing and wakeboarding um, going on so that was my first water ski experience I think I was like four or five years old uh, and I skied with my dad standing in front of him on his combo skis. All oh, right. Yep. And I mean, basically the skiing experience, I vividly remember the sound from the skis, you know, that whispering sound. I thought that was really cool. Um, but after that, I started to like ski on my own, but I had one, one hookup that, if that's the right word, uh, I was afraid of the water. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> and, and the lake that we, we skied at, which by the way, it's the same lake that I ski at now, uh, it was super deep and the, it was surrounded by a lot of trees. So the, the, the water were, for lack of a better word, polluted by the trees. So it was pitch black. Right. Uh, so being like seven, eight year olds laying a lot alone uh, in a pitch black, super deep lake, I, <laughs> I just, I did not enjoy that one bit. So that was that was holding me back for sure um but you know eventually i learned to beach start so i kind of get around that and all right <laughs> start, yeah start from the beach you know and, and and come back if i didn't crash obviously uh i would come back with like dry hair and and didn't have to be afraid so <laughs> yeah i didn't have to spend a lot of time in pitch black <laughs> no exactly and you know my father you know when you when you fall and and he turned the boat around. He didn't want to create like rollers for the other skiers. So he, he wasn't in a hurry to pick me up either. So I was just laying right. there. Yeah. But, but that kind of went away. Um, and I mean, this was all super recreational. I didn't have a clue about competitive skiing or, or even slalom courses at a time. Um, but really enjoyed skiing. Um, and then a couple of years later, I, I, I met a guy who had his own boat and a cabin at a lake and he was my age and it was pretty sweet because his parents uh, they flew to like Thailand for eight weeks each summer so we practically lived in his cabin and only left when we needed to buy groceries and gas and we just just skied skied all summer long so no way yeah that was that's that was gig. cool that's a good gig and he was much better than me in, as well in terms of techniques so I was able to pick up some tricks from him. Nice. Did yeah. you guys have a course there like at, at his cabin? No, no still course. no, still no course in sight for me. <laughs> okay. Um, and I was, I must've been like 16, 17, something like that. Um, and then I kind of lost skiing for, for a couple of years, uh, went into the, this whole, you know, motorcycle, dirt bike cars kind of vanished in my garage for like, I don't know, five, six years. Um, but then my brother actually got into uh, to skiing as well. My younger brother, um, he, he's seven years younger than me, and we didn't really hang out that much growing up, you know. 
Um, you don't bring your nine-year-old brother when you're 16 to hang out with your friends. So No, no, that's uh, <laughs> fair. <laughs> but when I, it must have been around the time when I was like 25 and he was 18. Um, he started to, to water ski uh, and, and I started to, to get back into it as well. Um, and I actually bought my first ski boat. I bought a 1989 uh, Ski Challenger, if you're familiar with that boat. Yep. Yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it's maybe not the best ski boat in hindsight, but you know, coming from like a 90 horsepower, two stroke outboard Johnson from 1984, that was just such an eye opener to, to have a real ski boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, big, uh, big upgrade. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, really. Um, and like I said, my brother were more into to skiing than I was, so he, he purchased his first like real ski, and that was the HO Free Ride. The year that that came out, it must have been like 2013 or 14 or something like that. Yep. Um, so we started to basically just you know Google around, try to find content on skiing and, and what's out there in terms of technique. And I remember my brother calling me like, you know, hey, I've, I found this dude on uh, YouTube. Uh, I don't remember his name, but he has dreads and he, he, he posts a lot of great content, you know, and he never smiles. So, so he, he went under the name, the name Mr. Never Smile for a while before we realized it was Marcus Brown. Dude, um, that's hilarious. <laughs> he never <laughs> smiles. Yeah. Uh. That was kind of his takeaway from his videos. But, but so we started to watch basically everything that Marcus, uh, had posted on YouTube and that, that's just great content. Uh, and I think I watched the Paradise Lost video every morning before I went skiing for an entire summer. So, no way. Uh, I hate to disappoint Marcus, but probably twenty percent of that viewings on that video is me. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So then we decided to to go check out the local club because there there were a water ski club uh, like in the area. So. Uh, we brought our boat and went up there because they didn't have a good boat at the time and we actually got to borrow their course uh, just to try it out um, and we skied a couple of sets and that was just such an eye-opener you know skiing for at least the better part of 20 years and then have something to chase you know the buoys that was just that was amazing like pouring gasoline on the fire really um, right away yeah right away the first the first turn i can still remember you know the tip of that bright red free ride because we skied his my brother's hl free ride at the time you know going around the buoy the first time that was just so cool um yeah only problem was that it was late september so this this club they went right to their course the week after um so we were kind of left hanging um right and went home, started Googling again, you know, where can we ski as soon as possible? And we find this, this place in Spain uh, called Extreme Gene. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So we made a reservation for, I think it was like March, the upcoming year. Um, and went there and it was just a blast. Uh, only problem though, we, I mean, we skied a couple of sets in, in September. And we went down in March, haven't really done much, that much physical activity during the winter. And we had made a reservation for four sets a day for five days in a row. <laughs> uh, so we, <laughs> I've, I've never been that sore in my life before or after. Uh, and since you know it, it's, it's a pretty remote location. So we had, we had to take our rental car and go to, to the next town to buy tape, to tape our palms because they were just bleeding. Um, we were a mess, but it was it was a lot of fun. So let's let's backtrack a little second to to the course because I, I can see how that would be super you know um, exciting after twenty years of sort of like doing turns and having a lot of fun, but sort of on your own rhythm, right? Uh, yeah. Now you got this thing which is I always refer to as a bit of a video game like, which is coming to you, and you have to to chase buoys. Like, I understand the excitement, but did you also feel, I don't know, like, I don't want to say clumsy, but you know, when you start the course the first time, you're not used to things coming at you, right? So it must yeah. have been also 
off throwing to a certain degree. Yeah, I mean, that was, I would say that was the time I realized that I wasn't that good of a skier uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that I thought I was. Because, you know, like in my sort of circle of friends, I uh, at the time I was the, by far the best skier because everyone was just free skiing for fun, like a couple of times a summer, whereas I did it much more than anyone else. So, so that was, yeah, I mean, it bummed me out a little bit, but, but still, like you say, it's, it's, the fun kind of turned that around anyway, so. Yeah. So I, you I'm, go, go ahead, sorry. No, I I'm, I'm just wanted to say that I'm, I'm still a lousy skier. I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling to get through the course at 15 off, um, at 52. Um, and that is essentially because I, I mean, I skied, we went to Spain and then I skied, I spent the whole summer in the course. Uh, and then I started to working on the off course uh, which meant that I have spent like 95% of my time on the water since then has been in the boat just watching other skiers, you know, um, right. But yeah. Huh? So, well, you, you're going through at 52, 15 off. I mean, you're, you're, so that means you're running 43, 46, 49, right? Like you, yeah. you've run the pass, you've run the course. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you ran the course, like six buoys with the gate and the exit gates? Yes. And how yeah, was that? Vividly. Uh, I mean, it was so cool. And that was actually in um, when we were at Extreme Gene in Spain. Mm. Okay. Um, Tell me the set. Like, what, what clicked? What made you run the course? I think I just... <laughs> I was pretty angry because that was... That morning we went out. There was like three or four sets a day uh, that day. And I remember falling on the first set that morning and basically just threw, throwing up my entire breakfast uh, on the first wake. Uh, so I was pretty Ooh. pissed. And I was just like, you know, I'm going to just hold on to this handle and never let go. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't like I was fine-tuning my technique or anything. It, it was just like, yeah, I need to, to run this pass to get over my crash. Right, right. And... What I, I think this would be very useful to a lot of listeners. I mean, you did 20 years of free skiing, right? Now, we could say maybe not particularly coached or, you know, sort of like self-taught, but you did 20 years on, on a slalom ski. And what I'd be curious to hear was, as you tried the course and you, you know, you discovered this thing and you wanted to, to get six boys like anyone else, um, what was the most challenging part and on the other side what was the thing that 20 years of skiing helped you in trying to run the course that's a good question um i think i mean the 20 years of skiing certainly helped like in terms of like you know like only the habit of, of being on one ski and to handle that ski um but i mean yeah, you kind of put me on the spot here. Uh, <laughs> no, I, mean, the, me, the, I might give you a little yeah. bit of context so that maybe it, it helps you, you know, like think back. Because, you know, in a sense, if you, if you started skiing or were part of a club with a course from the beginning, uh, all you do outside of the course becomes a function of, okay, now you're ready, Eric. Let's go in, you know, and, and let's turn one ball and see if you can get two ball. Yeah. Um, and then, of course... You could be a little bit better coached with, you know, okay, here, here's a drill to learn how to turn one, three, five. Here's a drill to turn two, four, six. How this is how you approach the gate. All these things, but at the end of the day, all all your skiing is geared towards turning those buoys which you see in front of you every day, and you're not really ready to ski them, right? What then? There's the other case, which is. I've always skied. I've always been on one ski. Oh, damn, there's a course. What is this? Let me try. Right. Yeah. So I think it's, you have those two types of skiers, you know? And so yeah. I'd be curious to hear your experience, which is obviously the, the, the second type. Yeah. And my experience is that, I mean, like I said, when I was growing up, no one really knew what they were doing in terms of technique. So they were just, you know, you can go ask someone that you thought skied better than you and you would get some advice and 
kind of pick up on his skiing, but that type of technique were not applicable in a course. Uh, and I would say like the, the biggest like change for me, I know there's a lot of talk in, uh, like on, on social media and ball of spray regarding like how much is gear and how much is uh, technique. And for me, I mean, there's a certain, I mean, I skied on, I skied on the worst ski possible till I was like 20 years old, 25 years old. Um, Cause I had no one to ask. And I basically just, you know, went on, on, on Blocket, which is like the, the Swedish version of Craigslist, uh, type yep. in slalom ski, find an old Connolly that I bought and thought that was super cool. Um, and I actually skied that one uh, right up until I went with my brother to this this um, water ski shop or pro shop, um, which there basically is just one or two off in Sweden. But we went there, um, my brother were, were to buy the, the HO free ride and the guy that has the pro shop asked me like, hey, what, what, what do you ski on? And I was like, you know, I, I ski this commonly. It's, I think it's like 62 inches long. And he just <laughs> stared at me, you know, and that, that guy is pretty, he, he's famous for speaking his mind. So right. he just like looked at me and like, hey, are you stupid? Or why are you skiing a kid ski? And I was like, I didn't know better, you know. <laughs> right, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry I did, to disappoint you. <laughs> but, but that was a huge eye opener for me because then I bought a, a, radar, a radar ski um, at the shop as well. And, and I mean, that, that transition from skiing a 20 year old. 63 inch Connolly jumping up to a radar vapor and that was just you know <laughs> right uh, right so I would say that improvement um, in terms of gear that is like I have never become I have never made such an improvement <laughs> in such short time since then right. uh, yeah and I mean listening to this being a like you know professional skier or hardcore course skier it might sound like I'm making this up, but I'm not. No, no, I'm, I don't think you're making it up. I mean, I can't tell you how many skiers I get through ski school here that show up with a ski that obviously it's not right for them. Um, and just putting them on something, you know, before even making any consideration of style or before even seeing this person ski, like you're like, okay, no, try this. And then they just go like, whoa, I, I've been on the wrong thing for, for so long. Yeah. And, and conversely, you find skiers who are on equipment that it's too high level for them. Yeah. And that impedes them also, right? And so you put them more on like a mid thing or like a free ride and then go, oh, okay, this is much more stable. Like I can turn without, you know, kissing the tip of the ski. That's good. And so the, the match of equipment is with skier is, is huge. I, I yeah. fully agree. Like, I don't know that it's necessarily, is it the technique or the, or the ski, but it's more so, are you on the right ski for you? You know, that's, exactly. that's the main thing. Yeah. You know? All right. So you're on your vape. So your first path, like your first run course, was it on the vapor? No, it was on the HO free ride. Ah, okay. Right. Sorry. Sorry. And then, so at the time you didn't have this, the, the vapor, you're skiing on your brother's ski. Managed to get six buoys. Tell me the feeling. Like, what was it like? I mean, it was just that feeling of accomplishment. Uh, and, you know, watching all of these YouTube videos of, of people skiing the course and being able to do it myself, that was just amazing. Um, that being said, you know, skiing that first pass, feeling like overwhelmed, getting up in the boat, high five the driver. Um, when I watched the video afterwards, <laughs> you know, right. it looked so good in my head, but, but yeah, but still, I, I still carry that feeling that it, it was just amazing. It was a blast that yeah. entire weekend, you know, skiing the course and being able to, to improve that fast. And I think that was, that was the best decision. Like, you know, just skiing the course a couple of times, uh, the previous fall, and then go down and get some proper coaching right away. So I didn't spend like three seasons in the course before I got coaching. I think that was just great because then I was able to 
I mean, I still carried a lot of old bad habits from my free skiing into the course, but if I were to spend like years and years in the course without coaching, I would have been, yeah, that, that process would have taken so much longer. So that was great that we, we were able to do that. Like, yeah, very smart, early on. you know, like, yeah, for sure. Like you sort of understood, okay, I better learn how to do this thing from someone that knows how to do it. And yeah. obviously, you know, Extreme Gene is warm in, in, in March already. So, no, that was good. This is a good yeah. story. So, you finish your week at Extreme Gene. You go home. I'm assuming, obviously, it's a little bit cooler. Um, what's, the, what's the mindset? Like, let me figure out how to ski as many passes as I can in a course? Yeah, basically. Um, and we live pretty... I mean, we don't live by the lake, but it's like just a three-minute drive down to this, this water ski club. Um, so there's and there's really not that much members, and it's on a, a local lake. or a, a, It's not a private lake, so you can go ski where, whenever you want, basically. Um, and at, the, at that time, we didn't have kids, uh, and I had both my brother and my wife as drivers, so there really weren't no limits in terms of you know i could go down and ski whenever i wanted so and that was pretty great um kind of missed those days <laughs> <laughs> so life life sort of evolved after that i'm assuming <laughs> yeah it did we have two toddlers now um which is great but it, it's not it's not a, as easy as it was you know to just ask the wife if, if she wanted to like drive the boat for, for a set or two and then just go home. So, right. Right. So, um, give, I'm, I'm trying to put this on a timeline. When was that March at extreme gene? How many years ago? 2016, 2016. Oh, okay. Okay. Fairly recent. And, um, I guess obviously the question I've, I've been waiting to ask is where did the idea of off course came about, you know? I mean, it it came about right right away. Uh, I would say like sp right after we arrived back from 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 Spain, because um, this course at the local club that where I ski, it, it is always at the wrong side of the lake, so to speak. Uh, right. There's always always windy, and it's a very it's a long lake, but it's it's very narrow, so you can see to the other side level of the problem and. There is always glass on the other side, uh, so yeah. And you know, being new to the whole course, course skiing experience, I basically just um, started to search the internet for some solution. You know, there's got to be some super portable course that you can just you know use to go to the other side of the lake. Um, and doing some research, realizing that there weren't really much out there, um, and Given what I'm doing for a living, uh, working with like local uh, factories, uh, helping them solving problems uh, in their manufacturing processes, uh, I'm sort of in the mindset of solving problems all the time. Um, okay. So I started to think like right away, how, how can I solve this? Um, and like I said, I didn't find anything. I find this thing called flag slalom, if you're familiar with that, that you can put like flags on your gunwales. Um, and to touch with the rope uh, and that was one way to simulate the course but I was really like hardcore into I need to have a physical mark on the water yeah. um, and I think that stems back to what I told you before uh, with that tip seeing the tip of my free ride or my brother's free ride turn around that first buoy and have something physical on the water uh, so I was really like into that um, but didn't really have an idea of how to 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 manage to do that um and later that summer my buddy got married so we were at his bachelor party uh and we were playing paintball right and this paintball uh, park were were located right next to a pond or a swamp basically um and luckily my buddy is not that good at shooting so he missed a lot <laughs> okay <laughs> and i remember you know seeing these paintball hit the water surface and create that splash and that was like the eureka moment you know right that right. is that's the way to go or at least i have to have to try to see if that works um so i called my brother 
uh, and asked him to pick up two rental markers on his way home from work, uh, which he did. And then I asked my wife if she wanted to to come out and like shoot me with paintball guns while I was skiing, and she did not hesitate one bit <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> yeah, well, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we went out and we were driving like alongside the uh, the course, uh, the regular course, just to get some sense of timing, you know, or rhythm. Um, and then Victoria, my wife, tried to shoot, you know, try to at least try to to manage to to shoot at the right rhythm, uh, which is obviously like in, kind of impossible. But but she managed to to get in like one or two or three strikes that were like kind of in the right place, right. and that was just mind blowing. You know, I was able to ski and turn around those like rings in the water or the splash in the water. Uh, and having a course on the fly and that was like that was the proof of concept that i needed to to you know pursue it further uh-huh that's such a cool story <laughs> so your buddy just missing shots at his bachelor party and then you went like <laughs> okay i got it <laughs> yeah that's a super cool story and i and i like i don't know if you ever seen uh, the edge in the water dvds that came out in the mid 2000s have you ever seen like Parrish King with his dad shooting paintballs at him? No, no, but I heard about it. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it was a pretty funny thing when he came out. You basically, I mean, the the father and son dynamic with the Parrish is really cool. And <laughs> in as much as your wife didn't hesitate, so didn't see his dad. And but but the the goal there was to actually, you know, shoot him. Hit him, know? yeah, yeah, hit him. <laughs> but that's cool. And and so the early the early days were basically this give me give me a sense of the early days attempt so you went with markers your wife trying to simulate the timing of the buoy which you know i don't i'm great job like i wouldn't want to play yeah. paintball against her no <laughs> and, and then where where did your mind go f from there like were you thinking something on shore like where did you go from there you know i in instantly jumped to you know trying to build a prototype um, and I was at the time I was contracting at this uh, this local factory that had a machine shop that I could borrow um, the guy that runs that place is, is into water sports as well so I kind of talked to him about my idea and he was like cool man and so I get to to use some of their machines and I managed to to build a, like a crude prototype just to to get a lot or to get more proof of concept, basically. Right. Um, and bought an, an Arduino circuit board and, and got a friend of mine to help me uh, make some, some simple code um, with, a, with a GPS antenna, basically just to be able to to see if it was possible to, to get the right rhythm and, yeah, in terms of using paintball guns. Um, and... Um, I remember that as well, you know, trying out that first prototype, that was, if, if seeing those paintball bounce uh, or making splashes on that, that swamp, playing paintball was one eureka moment, this was certainly the second, you know. So I was able to run and that, that first really, really early version did not have like a pre or a default set where, where the course ended. So I was able to just keep skiing, you know. Right. Um, and that was also when I found out that why would I, why would I simulate a course with six turns when I can just, you know, go on. Um, and that was just also mind blowing, you know, I think I ski like 20 turns or something like that, knowing where to turn. Uh, and that was that's just crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, that's, I mean, immediately, I mean, we'll get to it, but obviously I see so much potential in this, in this idea. And one of the first ones that came to mind was exactly of, you know, I don't have to ski six buoys. I can ski 14, you know? Like, yeah. Wow, that's so exactly. cool. So that was the second Eureka moment, sounds like. That was the second Eureka moment for sure. And then also realizing, I mean, that being said, this is not designed to replace uh, the regular slalom course. It's more designed to be a device that will make the free skiing sessions more entertaining. But... That was also the time when I realized that this will be an improvement in terms of the environment as well. Uh, 
course, you know, skiing a regular course, you ski like 16 seconds through the course. And if you're skiing at a public lake or a big lake, you will basically like have to, to go and do like the biggest turn to not bring rolls with you back in, into the course. Right. Uh, which means that you spend like 50 to 75% on the water with just turning the boat around, uh, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. So with the off course, you can, you can basically ski six turns if you want to, and you can just hang on to the handle and, and take a, a little rest behind the boat. And then you can just start the next program, the ski course again, uh, without having to get the boat out of the hole, you know? Right. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, so, so then, then I started to, you know, went back to Google, <laughs> started to try to, you know, how do I make my idea a, a, a product or how to, you know, and then I found, and I think it's worth, worth mentioning that Sweden is really like a hotbed for innovation uh, and always has been. So there's a lot of good like systems in place with uh, sub-governmental entities that, where you can go and, and get coaching and you can get some initial funding. Um, mm -hmm. And then I find this uh, one year certificate program uh, that was called development in innovation. And you had to have an invention um, to apply. Um, so I applied using the off course um, and got in. And that was a great experience as well, because that was a one year only focus on innovation development. So it took a vast grip on the whole process from, you know, product design, manufacturing, uh, IP and, and whatnot. So, uh -huh. so the product developed a lot during that year, but also like in terms of business, uh, setting up a company, um, open up the website, starting to take interest submissions and pre-orders, um, and so on. So, so that was a great year and that was the fall and spring of sixteen seventeen. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this interview with Eric. Uh, this is about the time where we get really into the um, off course system. Uh, before you listen to that part, uh, Eric told me to let you know that as a start, the off course system will be only available in the United States. I know uh, Eric is working on making sure that it will be available elsewhere. But for now, just be aware that if you are pre-ordering, um, you have to be in the US essentially. Um, I also have a couple of other announcements. Firstly, if you listen to last week's episode, Elizabeth Montavon launched her new apparel um, brand called Ski or Die. So if you haven't checked it out or if you haven't had a chance to order yet, you can go to www.skiordie.shop and if you punch in TWSP, all caps, at checkout, you get a nice 10% off but that will be only until February 19th. So you may want to get on the website and get your uh, shirts. And then finally, if you haven't subscribed yet, uh, or you might not even be aware of this, I have another podcast, which is called The Water Ski Bits. And The Water Ski Bits is essentially a shorter format, five to 10 minutes uh, audio clips from previous interviews or uh, previous water ski podcast episodes however next friday which is generally when i post the bits there will be some uh, unreleased material so if you want to listen to that which will not be on the water ski podcast go on apple spotify whatever you use and look for water ski bits and you can subscribe and tune in on friday for some unreleased content well that's it Let's get back to the interview. Right, right. Because I was going to say that was, yeah, like I, I couldn't really place in time when I started seeing chatter on Paula Spray about this, but I knew it has been a while, right? Yeah. Um, and I really like how this experience allowed you to progress because it sounds, I, I haven't, like maybe you can clarify to me what you do for a living, but it sounds a lot like, you're you're the problem solving hand you know hands on person but that doesn't necessarily translate into uh you know creating it selling it producing it you know all these other aspects which might not be your day-to-day -day job exactly uh 
Yeah, so I mean, I had that problem solving mindset from before. Uh, my father has his own manufacturing facility. Uh, so I kind of grew up there and grew up in the mindset of sort of efficient manufacturing. Uh, and he has always had this, for the lack of a better expression, but like farmer mentality, you know, where you have to, and I mean that in a good way, where you have to solve the problems that occurs with the parts that you have on the shelf yeah. um, on the given day. So I think that I've like forced him to be very creative and working closely with him uh, during my upbringing, I think that kind of rubbed off. Um, it's interesting because I would say that's also the anywhere ski club mentality. You know, like you, classic example, your your binding plate breaks, you don't have a bigger screw. How do, are you going to fix the, the plate on the ski so you can take one more set before you go to the hardware store? You know, yeah. <laughs> so no, no, I, but I like I never heard it as a farmer's mentality. You know, I, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, so and then I studied technology and entrepreneurship uh, during high school, and actually right after high school, I went on to start to work as a contractor for for the local local factories, basically working mm -hmm. with their manufacturing processes and and, and general problem solving, um, and also a lot of like repair and maintenance of of industrial machines. So, um, and I made a short a short detour for a couple of years. Um, and being a co-owner of a car detailing shop with a buddy of mine, um, but ended up selling my shares uh, to him after a couple of years um, mm -hmm. and went back to contracting. That was right around right the time that I met my wife and I, I lived in one one city and had the, the, the business in the next city and my wife lived, or the girlfriend at the time lived in the, another city, so I ended up commuting like yeah, it was just crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, yeah, I understand it. Yeah, so this doesn't work. So I, I went back to contracting. So I already had that like problem solving mindset, like you said, but I really needed to educate myself on how to bring a product to market because there's a lot of, and I remember during like the first week of this, this one year course, there was, was a guy that we're quoting, another famous inventor that has said that, like innovation is one percent inspiration and ninety nine percent persistence, and and I remember laughing at that at the time, but it it turned out to be true. Uh, mm. <laughs> and right. um, and that being said, I mean I'm all for like organic growth, because uh, in in this whole innovation bubble, there's a lot of buzz that you need to go and get funding and you need to make a kickstart campaign or whatever um, to make your business fly instantly but I'm more of I'm more into organic growth uh, I mean to keep the risk down but also I think the products that are are, are developed through organic growth it turns out much better in the end you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah you manage to get feedback you can you know risk you know, rescale your, your project. And exactly. yeah, I, I understand that. I understand that. Now, 1% innovation, 99% experience, um, persistence, right? Yeah. So you had the innovation, sounds like early, mid 2017. Um, where did the persistence come into play? When did you realize that that was the important part of the equation? <laughs> <laughs> I think I realized that when I had to, you know, I had my day, I still had my day job. Um, so I was basically doing this like after hours and I spent a tremendous amount of time on this, uh, developing the product, but also, and that was one, one thing that I, <laughs> I missed completely, uh, early on, you know, was to, to really calculate manufacturing costs. So mm -hmm. when I, I graduated from this, this certificate program. Um, I realized that this product is going to be crazy expensive. Uh, and that was essentially, you know, cause, cause you're taking a lot of feedback and you want everyone to be happy. So I ended up, you know, adding all the bells and whistles in the book. Um, and the product was, I mean, the short it was really cool, but it didn't, it, it would have been impossible to manufacture at that price. Um, right. And realizing that was a bummer. Um, but like I said before, 
organic growth, the product, it, it takes time, but the product evolves and gets much better. So, and in fact, the, the product that I'm selling right now is actually version 4.1. So I went back, basically went back to the drawing board, threw out all the blueprints and started over three times. Uh, wow. Yeah, and that's where the persistence uh, comes into play. And to be honest, I don't, I mean, looking back, I don't really know where I found that persistence or where that came from. Because uh, it is, it, yeah, it's been, it's been a rough, hard process, but, but the product turned out pretty good. <laughs> yeah, no, and we're going to talk about the product, but I, I'm still curious about where that persistence came from. Like, do you think it's, it's more like, I don't know, your personality, like, Sort of like, uh, I like the analogy of the farmer uh, mentality, which apart from do the best with what you have, in my view is also get it done, right? Yeah. So do you think it's more that or is more just like passion for skiing? Like, what brought you to, you know, spend all those after hours getting this project right? I think it's a combination of, of those two I mean like I said working with my dad he who is this like the persistence like persona uh, always run his own business and a lot of like relatives have their own businesses so kind of having that mindset like from early on and like you said you need to get it done um, and that in combination with the passion for skiing and also I, I would have to you know get back to all that Marcus Brown content that that was basically what what kept me going um, you know being able to watch videos uh, of really cool water ski stuff and think to myself that I can be a part of that and I can be able to you know he he talks a lot and I know that that's your vision too like about growing the sport yeah, and that kind of became my my vision as well. And to I wanted to contribute um, to the sport and and be able to, you know, give the opportunity to more more people to feel what I felt the first time I I, I saw my ski turn that first buoy. Uh, in this case, it's not buoys, but but I want to be, yeah, make it possible for people to to ski the course wherever they wherever they want, basically. Uh, so I would say it's, it's cool. Yeah, I, so I think it's the combination of these two. Uh, the mindset of, of getting things done and the passion for, for water skiing. Yeah, that's a, that's a powerful combo, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for powerful sure. powerful combo. Now, let's get more into the, into the details. Like, what were the challenges you were facing as you were going through the iterations of the off-course? Like, what were the, the things you were struggling with or that you had to redo? Uh, if we were talking about like the technical aspect of the product, uh, there was like like I touched upon before the uh, to get the price down and, and kind of like peel the product, uh, remove all the unnecessary stuff and like refine parts and combine parts. Uh, I remember the first version was I think it was like if it was sixty four machine aluminum parts. Uh, <laughs> which is crazy in hindsight, but I managed to, to combine and refine all the parts. So I get it done. The, the current version is 14 machine parts. Um, and that also okay. means that every part has been a part of this process, uh, of evolution. So I'm pretty confident in, in each of those, uh, those parts. Um, right. um, but in terms of challenges, I mean, funding uh, for sure is, is a big challenge. And yeah. as a start, I, I mean, I, I, I had some investors, but that is like very recent. So at the first year, so I basically funded this with my paycheck, uh, which meant that I had to work, you know, and ba basically just wait a couple of months and then, then do this and that and, and order these parts. Um, so that was a challenge. Um, and then in terms of technique is, I think one challenge has been to find, find the right or find the expertise, uh, you know, mm. knowing who to ask. Cause I'm not, the electronic part is one, one thing that I'm not that comfortable with. So I had to you know, 
bring someone to help me with that and to find the right right partners to work with um that's been a, a challenge for sure yeah it's always always hard right like one yeah. thing is the having the technical knowledge the other one is can i work with this guy before i want to you know strangle him you know exactly. I, it, it happens it happens <laughs> yeah what about um in terms of like the the actual skiing because I'm, I'm i'm assuming there has been a lot of trial and error on the water like yeah with the with the machine on the boat you skiing behind it like what were some of the the challenges you faced oh there's been so many uh <laughs> <laughs> i bet <laughs> yeah um well i had a lot of trouble uh, with the whole like triggering mechanism if we were to dive like really dive into details that mm -hmm. was a huge challenge because at the beginning i didn't you know it, it's all triggered with this like um solenoid coils uh and to be able to find the right timing um uh, for these solenoid coils to activate the markers but being able to get to their home position in time for the next um for the hammer in the in the chamber in the markers to get back that has been just a hassle uh, mm -hmm. figuring out that timing uh and, and get that make that work basically to to get the markers to fire automatically um, okay yeah um and also i mean there there's a lot of angles involved uh as well uh, <laughs> and right. I, I i'm not sure if i have the, the proper english to to describe it all but but being able to adjust you know the markers are panned forward and they are also like tilted uh, individually uh with adjustment knobs um and there's yeah there's been a lot of trial and errors and like you said as far as skiing um uh, i have spent most of my time in the boat developing this because i'm not a good enough skier so i had to bring a focus group uh, of a lot of great skiers that um you know to get their input on it um and there's especially one guy at my local club uh he also named eric and he's this you know badass crash test dummy uh <laughs> <laughs> and, nice. um, yeah he's a great friend and he's, he's really been important to the project he's never you know hesitated um even if it's like you know three four degrees in water uh, celsius he just you know jumps in uh, and does what what needs to be done um so shout out to eric that's great because i i'm assuming you know you've been exposed to a few ski clubs by now and you might have noticed how skiers tend to be a little bunch of picky people right if the <laughs> thing is not right if the the boat is not leveled if the blah 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 so I think you did a great thing in bringing in someone like that to develop, to help you develop and, and, and test your project because, you know, um, I am a skier. I can tell you if certain things are not the way I, I predicted or envision or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. That I, I'm, I might come and tell you, you know, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's cool. I think, I, I think that was a smart idea on your part to bring someone in who skis the course regularly, who has done it for a long time um, and, and test it out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had to, uh, and there's, I mean, there's a, there's a learning curve. It's, it's very like effortless to use, but there's still a learning curve to it because you have to, mm -hmm. I mean, in the, in the boats traveling path, it's very exact or accurate. Uh, since I use one of the best GPS antennas on the market, um, it is very accurate in that path, but you still have to like adjust course width and calibrate it. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so one of the questions I have is about speed, right? So does your system account for the speed of the boat? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Uh, okay. it, it automatically like recalibrates a uh, hundred times each second. Uh, for the boat speed so you don't have to worry about you know adjusting boat speed or anything it it, it, it managed that on its own that's really cool i yeah. see i thought you, you had to insert some speed which made sense but no the antenna recognizes the speed and adjusts yeah. the the course accordingly yes wow what about the 
the distance of the buoys from the boat path. Yeah. Uh, so that is one thing that you need to, when you get your off course, you need to, to make like a first time calibration. Whereas um, there's an instruction video for this on the website. Uh, if someone wants to go check that out, it's rodixinnovation.com. Uh, that's R-O-D-I-C-S innovation.com. There's a lot of... There be links all over. Also. Yeah, there be links all over. Okay. <laughs> yeah, great. So there's one like initial calibration that you do basically just to put these indicators on the boat. So you put two, two objects um, beside the boat, um, 11 and a half meters out from the center line, and you use your full length rope and just to make a mark on the gunways of, on the boat that you can use when you're on the water. So you do this first step on the trailer. Uh, and then once on the water, the skier pulls out until the rope tangents the mark that you made on the gunwale or before. And there's a calibration program in the off course where you calibrate one, one side at a time because they, they are individually adjustable, the markers. Mm -hmm. So the skater pulls up to the left and the driver starts the, the calibration program for the left side and the off course marks like three, three splashes in a row in a rapid sequence so that the skier gets like a line uh, of buoys on the water surface to look for. Right. Right. And it's pretty easy to see if you're inside that, that line or outside and then you have to communicate with, with the driver or the spotter preferably um, if it needs to be adjusted. Okay. And then, yeah. And so I'm assuming also that the positioning of the off course on the windshield is crucial. Um, or am I getting this wrong? It's not crucial. I mean, it's, of course, it's, it's best to have it in the middle. And there is a center mark on the off course that shows you where the exact middle is. And so that you can, can attach it to the windshield. But like I said, both sides are like individually adjustable. So it doesn't, it's not that crucial that you might think. Uh, uh -huh. And the same goes for like boat leveling. The boat doesn't have to be dead level since you can adjust e each side. But the important thing is that you, once calibrated, you don't want to like your whole crew to move to the other side of the boat, you know? Right, right. Yeah, you know, I get it. Yeah, no, no standing up and running around the boat whilst there's people skiing, which is wrong to begin with. We, we yeah, don't want to do exactly. that. <laughs> but definitely it helps to keep the course right. Yeah. Um, going away from technicalities a little bit, I, I'm curious to hear what is your vision behind this? You know, like obviously the, the straightforward idea is you get to ski the course where there's no course, right? Yeah. Um, but what are, I, I mean, I'm curious, what are the possibilities you have thought about, right? Do you mean like in terms of business and in terms of, or in terms of pure skiing? Skiing. I'm, I'm thinking skiing right now. Like, what do you think this product allows, like, you know, maybe new things in, in the sport, you know? Yeah, I think, I mean, the initial thought was, you know, skiing the regular course, realizing that it's always in the wrong place, basically. Uh, like you said, a skier, I'm pretty picky. I want the best possible uh, conditions. Uh, right. And seeing that glass on the other side of the lake, I wanted to be able to go there. So I wanted to create an extremely portable slalom course that were attached to the boat and that will build in, in a course on the fly basically mm -hmm. um, and also like we, we touched upon before being able to ski more than six turns um, and to kind of jack up that that free ride experience or free skiing experience being able to to ski 20 or 30 turns knowing where to turn and you being able to do that basically anywhere right uh, right so we had we had this big big lake uh, a few towns away that is just it's gorgeous the water is so pristine um, and it just goes on for miles and I haven't been able to ski there yet with the off course of course it's 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 rarely like glass it's almost always choppy but but that is one vision vision and not just for me to be able to go to that lake but for, for anyone to be able to you know visit that amazing place smash the off course on the windshield and just, you know, push play, basically. 
Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's super cool. I mean, there are a lot of places like that that I think um, they will bring to a different experience, right? Like one yeah. thing is to find a body of water that you can free ski on. And Marcus, if you're listening to this, I, I love it like any other person. But to turn buoys there, that's that's yeah. another story, right? Exactly. Um, one of the things I thought about, which I don't know if you're aware with this, but like in Switzerland, it's extremely hard to place a course on a body of water for various types of regulations, which explains why a lot of Swiss skiers come to Italy, go to Austria, go to France um, yeah. to ski the course. Like this would allow them to, to practice the rhythm of the course, you know, be, before they go and, and ski a tournament, say. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and I mean, it can, it can definitely be used to as a training tool to improve your timing uh, and so on. And I had a law firm make like a general overview um, regarding this and, and they didn't find any obstacles at the time. Uh, but again, there's, I can't guarantee that there won't be any local regulations somewhere uh, uh, regarding this, but, but that's like the... Yeah, the foundation that that you 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 should be able to go ski anywhere. Yeah, yes, yeah. ski it and, and turn the the buoys anywhere. No, that's 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 some fantastic. Random side question: uh, Do you have to turn one ball to the right, or can you also turn one ball to the left? Uh, you have to turn. Uh, you can choose. Act, no, you can't choose. I'm sorry. You have to edit that out. <laughs> okay. But so there's there's a zero ball. I call it a zero ball shot to the left um, mm -hmm. before the course starts, and that is shot like 54 meters before the the actual course starts. So if you turn that buoy and cross the wakes, you should be crossing the wakes where the gate would be if there were yep. gates. So, so now you have to start to turn that, that zero buoy on the left and then the course starts like it normally does on the right. Okay, okay. That's, it, it's a random question because I don't know if you followed up, but um, there have been a few people mounting reverse courses and trying them out. It's, it's a side thing, but uh, I was just curious to see if that was a possibility with the, with the, with the off course. Yeah, um, but I mean, it, since you since the off course don't end, you can just I mean, you can wait a couple of seconds and turn the first buoy on the left if you want to. That's true. That's true. That's right. Um, but what what is the what what's the purpose of having like opposite courses? So the idea you'll hear a lot of chatter, a lot of different opinions about this, but the idea is that say as a left foot forward you have an advantage of turning three on-site turns and two off-sites if you take six ball out right yeah um so, so a lot of right foot forwards have said hey let's let's swap it up and see if it's a little bit easier right and famously last year freddie winter did it at his site and he showed that he ran 41 off regular course and then inverted course right okay. uh, so there's been a bit of fun playing around with that. Um, but no, I was just curious to hear. But obviously, the course remains one ball to the right. I mean, that's that's what we ski, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, all right. The, look, I, I, I told you when, when we sort of connected that I had a, an idea that I wanted to share with you. And yeah. you, might have, you might have heard it from... from I might have mentioned it in, in previous episodes, but basically... A coach that we had uh, at our ski school uh, sadly passed away uh, last year, and he, for like historically, he ran a ski school on a pl on a public lake, uh, which is the public lake where I grew up, um, forever essentially. And so, one of the ways I thought about paying tribute to him was to ski the lake nonstop. It's about sixty-five kilometers. Um, wow. Yeah, it's it's a challenge. <laughs> uh, with his boat, which he, you know his daughter uh, still owns, and and basically loop it, you know. And wow. I thought, how cool would it be to ski the course where he had the course? And yeah. and what's cool is that over the years, because I think he opened that ski school in in the early seventies. Over the years, he has had the course at different spots of the lake. 
right? Wow. Yeah. So the idea was, wouldn't it be cool if I could ski the course everywhere where you say I had a course over the years, right? <laughs> and that obviously came up, boom, of course, right? That so, would be awesome. You know? So that's that, that was honestly like one of the things that, that reminded me of your project. And I went, okay, let's see how that thing is going. I remember seeing it a few times. And then I saw, I saw how far you've, you've come with that. And I honestly think it could be revolutionary in the sport. Uh, and I say that because I interviewed Horton uh, last week. And what I have a podcast. And what I've noticed is that there's so many people skiing that we don't know about. And skiing yeah. the way sort of like you skied before you found out or got a chance to try the course. Namely, enjoying the sound of the ski, enjoying being outside with friends and reaping a few turns, right? Exactly. And I, I just think that, I'm not, I don't think I'm exaggerating here, what the free ride types of ski brought to the water ski community, this product could bring the same. Cool. I really believe yeah. that. I'm, I'm, I really I'm still that. stoked to hear that you, you're on board. <laughs> oh, I, I definitely am. I definitely am. So what are, what are the next steps right now? Can I, can I get on the website and order an off course? Uh, basically, you can. The, the website is being updated this week with an, an e-commerce platform because it, it has been a little bit like a hassle to, to order up until now. So, uh, But I had the first batch out to be the testers this fall. Um, sold up in like a week um, and I'm actually building the second batch right now uh -huh. which is also almost sold out I think it's just like two or three units left from from the second batch and I will start working on the third batch in, in a couple of weeks so what I'm doing now is that I'm taking down payments uh, for the upcoming batch so you can visit the website uh, rodixinnovation.com um, and make a down payment and I will set set a unit aside uh, for the, from the next batch um, yeah and I just want to to stress that due to this whole pandemic situation uh, building these batches has been taking much more time than I wanted to uh, yes. so if someone listening to this want, wants their own off course and wants it this summer I highly recommend that you visit the website and make a down payment as soon as possible yeah I get it yeah especially because it sounds like you need there's a lot of people that you need parts from. They might have their own issues getting their own parts or, you know. Exactly. It, it, it sort of scales down pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, look, I, I'm, I'm stoked about this. Um, I mean, personally, I, I have to be honest, I can't wait to try it. You know, like I can't wait to, 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 to experience that, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but I'm. On a broader sense, I'm obviously much stoked about what this project can do for the, sk the skiing community. Yeah. Um, look, uh, in projects like this, right, uh, there's always people, uh, you mentioned Eric, our test dummy. Uh, anyone else that you want to give a shout out for, for helping you with this? Yeah, there, there's two more. <laughs> there's my buddy Mons, uh, who's been helping me with all the digital stuff, like the website and the early early videos uh, as well. Uh, he's been a tremendous uh, guy working with during this project. Uh, so shout out to Mons. Uh, and also, I mean, I have to make a shout out to, to Victoria, my wife. Uh, maybe not in terms of product development, but the level of patient, patience that he, she has showed me during this project is just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it was fun in the beginning where she had to shoot at you, but then I'm assuming <laughs> there was a lot of weird, you know, not being at home, having to test things, you know. Yeah, I yeah, for imagine. sure. Like four, four years later, um, and I, I still, I'm still doing this. Um, so yeah, and you're still She's, with your wife. So it sounds yeah, like, I'm still with you know, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like everything is going in the right trajectory. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. 
Well, Eric, look, this was it was a pleasure having you here. Um, I've been wanting to do this for a while, and I mean, honestly, I I'm wishing for the best for this project. I truly believe it can make a difference to a lot of skiers, and in a lot of ways, you know, like um, it can get people close to skiing. It can get people close to tournaments just because they get to try the course. Um, I really see a lot of potential in this project. So obviously I wish you for the best. I hope you, you can't keep up with the orders. That's my, no. that's my hope. <laughs> Thank you, Matteo. Thank you for having me. It was, it was real fun talking to you and I really enjoy the content and what you're doing with the podcast. Thank you, buddy. To, to the next time. Yeah. Talk soon. Nice. Well, wow. Well, well. Thanks. I was nervous. <laughs> That's what everyone says. You know? Yeah. <laughs>